My name is Paul Hellyer, former Minister of National Defence for Canada, and I'm about to do an interview for The Hannibal TV. I'm with Paul Hellyer here. He is uh, the Honourable Paul Hellyer, former Minister of National Defence of Canada, former Minister of Transport, and you spent two terms in Parliament as well, I understand. More than that, I was a Member of Parliament for 23 and a half years. So that was quite a long while. So just a little bit of background information, where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in southwestern Ontario, about 90 miles west of Toronto, where I was raised on a ginseng farm. <coughs> My father pioneered the ginseng business in Canada, and it was uh, actually one of Canada's first exports to the Orient in the uh, late uh, 18th century. So it has a, a very romantic uh, history. Then I went to school there, went to California to study aeronautical engineering for a while, came back, worked in the industry, aircraft industry for a while, uh, joined the Air Force uh, and became a surplus air crew, and then joined the Army for a year, and after that uh, decided to go to uh, <clears throat> the University of Toronto to get even with <laughs> Mackenzie King for wasting my time, <clears throat> and uh, graduated in arts, um, which had included mathematics and uh, and physics and uh, especially economics, which was my principal passion in life. And uh, graduated in May of uh, 1949 and was elected to the House of Commons in June of that same year. And you also had your private pilot license, I understand? Well, I did. I learned to fly in California. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, uh, well, one interesting point is I was flying over the San Fernando Valley solo the day of Pearl Harbor, which uh, had some interesting repercussions because there was a guy down on the field waving a flag madly at me and I didn't know what it meant because nobody had told me, so I did a couple of circuits and finally started to run out of gas and, and landed and got balled out like you know what because uh, he said, why didn't you land at once? And I said, why? I thought I didn't know what the, the flag meant. And he said, there's been an attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, so it was an interesting part of my life. Later on, I wasn't uh, able to uh, get a Canadian uh, private pilot's license because the government stopped issuing them during the war. And is it true that you uh, had some participation in the war efforts in the Second World War? Well, just that I was, uh, I was, in the forces for two years, one in the Air Force and one in the Army, and, and learned a lot of things, including how inefficient the, uh, the forces really were in working together. As a matter of fact, uh, they seemed to be um, fighting each other sometimes instead of fighting the war, and uh, this was certainly a factor later on when I became Minister of National Defense and decided to, uh, that it was important to unify the armed forces uh, the Army, Navy and Air Force and make them into a single Canadian Defence Force. What every Minister of Defence in the world wanted to do, but uh, as uh, Robert McNamara, my uh, opposite member in the United States uh, said, didn't have the guts to do. So it was a pioneering thing and for eight years uh, we had the best military organization in the world and then subsequent governments began to unravel it and undo most of the uh, good. Some of it's still there, but not uh, very much, and that's a pity. So you united the Canadian forces when you were Minister of National Defence. Uh, what were some of your other duties that you were involved with uh, during your term? Well, I, I was Minister of uh, Transport, as you said, and when I was Minister of Transport, I was responsible for uh, a lot of things. Uh, I was able to make a deal on a West Court Coast uh, port facility for uh, uh, Vancouver and British Columbia that had been uh, uh, argued about for years and uh, <laughs> I was able to bring some uh, skills of uh, compromise and uh, cooperation into the situation and we got a deal and got it done and we did a lot of uh, little things like that that needed cleaning up and, uh, and built uh, an extra bridge to the airport in uh, Vancouver, which is used by everybody in the city who's going to the airport. And, uh, you know, a lot of things that uh, were important and um, 
it was actually a very interesting portfolio and uh, I enjoyed the challenges which are many and um, I think uh, it was generally recognized that I did a pretty fair job while I was there. And I guess you worked fairly closely with both Lester B. Pearson and Pierre Elliott Trudeau later on. Um, is there any of the two prime ministers that you preferred to work with? Well, actually, um, I worked with three. I was a minister in the government of Louis Saint Laurent for eight years, for um, about eight weeks in 1957, just before the election. They wanted to uh, reduce the average age of the <laughs> of the uh, cabinet, I guess, to see if it would help uh, uh, politically. And I got the nod. And as a matter of fact, I was the first liberal minister ever elected from the city of Toronto. Now there had been a couple of ministers including one prime minister who had moved in there for by-elections when they couldn't get their own seat. But I was the first one who had ever come up uh, through the ranks in Toronto and uh, and won my seat and was uh, appointed uh, liberal minister since confederation. So that was uh, I thought a little feather in my cap. And then uh, uh, went on from there and uh, tried to do as much as I could uh, in all of the tasks that were assigned to me. I think Saint Laurent was my favorite of the three because he was the last uh, of, the, of, the, of a kind. He was like fatherly chairman of the board and he gave his ministers their heads and uh, then, uh, you know, if they didn't pan out, why that was too bad, but he didn't try and micromanage uh, the, the departments, that's what ministers were for. Len Pearson was uh, a very jovial kind of way, a uh, person and a uh, wonderful next door neighbor. He was not really a politician, he was a diplomat. And um, I enjoyed him, although as a matter of fact, I don't think he would ever, maybe ever have been prime minister without me because uh, he was not too highly regarded in the Liberal Party, and uh, I guess uh, for because he seemed to be indecisive, and uh, so I helped her primarily organized a, a huge uh, convention-like meeting in Ottawa with more than 2,000 people there um, <coughs> to really reinforce his leadership. Uh, his hold on the leadership and uh, managed to do that very successfully by getting Saint Laurent to lay the, uh, his hands on him despite some violent opposition by one of my colleagues. He was quite a guy and of course the, the flag debate was uh, one of the principal accomplishments of his era, but uh, there were many including uh, hospital insurance and so on. and. Uh, and of course, the unifi unification of the armed forces, which was a which was a a, a major major uh, achievement in the sense of doing the impossible, because it's almost impossible to change anything of significance in government, and uh, <laughs> and when you do, it's a, at great cost. And uh, P uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, of course, was very different <clears throat> because he was. Uh, he was a different kind of a person. He was his own person, intellectually, uh, in the sense of a quick mind. He was the fastest, I think, of any of the prime ministers I've known. Uh, he had uh, some drawbacks, as we all do, but uh, he was an interesting person to uh, to work with. And uh, I guess uh, it was unfortunate that he wasn't uh, more interested in housing when uh, he gave me that uh, responsibility as well as Minister of Transport because that was the issue in which I had to uh, leave the government because he had said in effect, well, where do you rate housing in the, in the list of, uh, of problems for the country? And I can't remember whether he said it was 64th, it doesn't really matter. It was not, you know, it was not a matter of major concern when in fact it was one of the principal issues in the country at that time as it is today. 
And when you were in your positions of power, did you ever deal with any UFO reports at those times? No, the only the only connection I had was um, uh, sighting reports, and I got periodic sighting uh, sighting reports from the Air Force. And uh, frankly, I didn't have too much time to worry about them because I was fighting a battle, really a war of the unification, and that took up all of my time and emotional energy. <clears throat> so. Uh, I didn't have uh, I didn't have a lot of interest in the subject at the time, but these reports came across my desk, and uh, they would identify about 80 percent of the of the sightings as natural phenomena of one kind or another, uh, early morning view of Uranus or something like that, and uh, about 20 percent were unidentified. In other words, they they had no explanation for them. And they, of course, qualified as UFOs in the, in the definition of unidentified flying objects. That's what they were, unidentified flying objects and nothing more. I mean, was, uh, there was no proof of who they were or where they came from, but we knew that we didn't know uh, who they were and uh, where they came from and uh, suspected that they might be uh, beings coming from far distances because we didn't have anything uh, in our technology that was anywhere close to the kind of technology that they had where you, they could uh, fly so fast, stop, uh, maneuver, and, uh, and then uh, take off again with uh, G ratings that would have killed a, a normal human being. So at, the, at that time you didn't discount that it would have been uh, something extra, extraterrestrial, you just had way too much other things on your plate. You've got it exactly that is the best way of describing it. <laughs> so when exactly did you start to uh, develop a more serious interest in the UFO phenomenon? Well not until about 12 years ago. That's uh, like uh, being 2005. Actually um, for some months before that a young uh, bilingual chap from Ottawa the name of Pierre Junot, and interestingly enough, coincidentally, I had got a, an email from him this morning, um, was sending me material. And I was honest with him. I said, Pierre, I haven't got time to read it. And he was very patient with me and said, well, why don't you just put it on a shelf for a rainy day? And I decided, well, that was the least that I could do, so I just did that. Well, then two things uh, happened. One, he asked me uh, if I would watch an ABC special uh, put together by Peter Jennings, uh, who was uh, an Ottawa boy working for ABC. And I said yes. And um, so I watched it, and I must say I was impressed because here were all of these uh, former Air Force officers, uh, commercial airline pilots, air traffic controllers and policemen saying that they had seen UFOs. And I said to myself, why would they say that if they didn't? I mean, what point would there be to go on the air and lie about something um, which in many cases would bring some ridicule um, if, they, if they hadn't actually experienced it? So I took that away in my in the back of my head. And then the other thing, Pierre sent me a, a book called The Day After Roswell. And um, I said, oh, that would be interesting reading sometime. I only have about two opportunities a year to read books. Um, one is at Christmas and the other is in the summer. If I take a week or two at the lake, we have a little place on uh, Lake Muskoka that my late wife and I ran as a lodge for 45 years and is still continuing now as a uh, housekeeping cabins. And uh, so I thought to myself, well, I'll just take it up there and uh, put it on my reading list. Well, when I went to go f for the holiday in, two th I guess it was 2004, um, I, I couldn't find it. And so I took uh, The Life of Pi which I read with great interest, and I must admit that I, did, I was near the end of the book 
before I could tell whether it was fact or fiction, it was so well written. Well, in the following year, 2005, I was looking for another book and couldn't find it. And lo and behold, staring me in the face from the bookcase was the day after Roswell. So I grabbed it and took it. I started to read it. And my nephew came along and said, what are you reading? I said, uh, the day after Roswell. And he said, well, I'm a skeptic. I said, oh, you're entitled to be a skeptic. It's uh, still a free country, more or less, getting less all the time. And uh, so I, f I finished the book and I said to myself, this is not f fiction because I recognize the names of many of the generals and the airports uh, that were named in the book. I said, these are real people and I, I know about them from my days in, uh, in national defense. And uh, my nephew had gone home and he phoned me and said, uh, I, I phoned the general and told him what you were reading and he said, every word is true and more. Where can I get a copy of the book? So I told him. And um, in the meantime, and just total coincidence or serendipity, but I think, I, frankly, the way I believe, I think it was more than that. Um, I had received this invitation to speak uh, at an extraterrestrial conference in Toronto at the University of Toronto um, in September of 2005. And I had absolutely no intention of accepting the invitation. I was, I have to admit, I was procrastinating. I just didn't get around to it. I was, or thought I was too busy to take the time out to get in touch with the two people, Victor Vigiani and Mike Bird, who were sponsoring it, and let them know that I wouldn't be able to, uh, to accept. So, uh, it just happened that that invitation was still outstanding. And after reading the book, I said, I think maybe I should go to that conference because the issues involved here are so big, huge. The American people are paying hundreds of billions of dollars for programs that they don't know anything about. And uh, things are happening in their country that they don't know anything about. And they should know because the United States forces and the Air Force, I guess, is um, in particular, sort of operate with a shoot first and ask questions after mentality. And I said, heaven knows what they could get us into. You know, if they start shooting at these things, um, they could get us in a, an intergalactic war and uh, that would be uh, probably game over for us. So I was concerned and I thought, I have a responsibility um, as someone who has had a job of uh, some authority to, uh, to say unequivocally what I believe. Well, two things I had to clear. And one was I was getting married a week to the day after the conference. I'd been married to my former wife for 59 years, but she had died the previous year. And uh, the widow of my best friend uh, was, uh, said that she would marry me, so I thought it was good if the two of the four people who used to spend a lot of time together over a 35 year period uh, got together and kept the flag on. So um, I had to phone her and uh, I told her what it was and I said, uh, she was not very enthusiastic, I have to admit. And I said, well, it'll just be one, one time off and um, that, that'll be the end of it. And I didn't mean to deceive her, as she well knows, because I had no idea what the outcome was going to be. Well, then the, the second thing is I phoned my uh, nephew and said, uh, give me the general's uh, telephone number, give me a heads up that I'll be calling. Because I thought I should check with him personally and hear his voice and what he had to say. And I had met him, so I knew who it was. And uh, so I phoned him. And before I could even say, hello, how are you? What's the weather 
like he said, every word is true and more. That was, those were his opening words. And he spent 20 minutes telling me the end more within the limit of his oath, I guess it went as far as he could. And he said, and this was the, the most important thing he said during that period was that there have been face-to-face -face meetings between United States officials and visitors from other star systems, period. No equivocation. And so with that assurance, um, and my own conviction based on what I already knew, I said, I'll go to the meeting. And uh, at the meeting, I said mm, that UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. And that was it. After that, just the, the information that kept rolling in from all over the world, books and, and uh, documents, some classified, some not, and so on. A lot of things happened, which you're well aware. Now, what would you point at as the best uh, evidence to the people in the media that say there is no credible evidence uh, that exists to support the existence of UFOs? Is there one particular thing that really jumps out at you that you would point out? To well, there them? are so many, actually. Um, as of today, um, if somebody just wanted to read one book to find out uh, what the score is, it would be a book called Undisclosed by uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, MD, who is one of the best ufologists in the world and has been in this business uh, for years and years and years. And the reason is because he quotes people verbatim. He quotes people who have seen them, people who have been working on extraterrestrial on sh airships to replicate the, uh, the visiting airships, uh, people who have been working in what we call the black ops, the special uh, <clears throat> projects as they call them, but they're referred to as black ops because only a few people have any idea of what they're all about. And he has been very thorough in pointing out a lot of things that nobody else has really put their finger on and substantiated them with first-hand evidence. Now, interestingly enough, Dr. Greer was the first person to brief me after I went public. He was visiting uh, uh, Toronto and uh, I guess to make a speech and so uh, we had lunch on the waterfront and he's, he briefed me for three hours and told me some of the things that he did including briefing uh, future presidents and, uh, and chiefs of intelligence who didn't know what was going on because they weren't allowed to know and uh, gave me a lot of information and uh, this is his most recent book <coughs> He held a press conference uh, a number of years ago at the press um, building in Washington where he had a lot of these people speaking on camera. He had uh, the, one of the largest audiences ever for this kind of uh, an expose. And uh, now, of course, he's getting a much wider view with a new film and uh, with this, uh, this book, which which unlike a lot of books, including my own, are really often secondhand knowledge, which I am convinced are accurate enough to take the responsibility for. And that's the way it should be, but it's different than having eyewitnesses uh, come on. I have, I have a couple of those too, because there are a couple of outstanding cases, like the Bentwaters case, in the UK, which has been so well documented that nobody in there with any kind of intelligence whatsoever could read the latest book by uh, Colonel Halt on that uh, episode without, uh, without coming to the conclusion it was legitimate. And, and he was one of the first, he was, as a matter of fact, the first person that I ever interviewed live um, on this subject, uh, I was in Washington for the National Prayer Breakfast, and uh, 
after it was over, I went to see him, and the only reason he would see me is because I had uh, I had stopped in uh, in London the previous year on my way to uh, to the Middle East to see what was going on there, which I recount in my book uh, Light at the End of the Tunnel, and I wanted to have seen the and talk to people firsthand before putting it in the book, which is the way I try to operate. And uh, so uh, I, w I went that way and talked to the person who had been in charge of the British uh, Armed Forces UFO desk. And he gave me this case because it had gotten into the public domain. And so, uh, as a result of that, Colonel Hall said that on his recommendation that I could, uh, he would see me. So, I talked to him for, well, on tape, for two hours, and and put a lot of it in my book because it just covered all the bases of the incredulity. Oh, don't give me that sort of thing, you know. When a report comes in, yeah, stop kidding me. This, stop wasting my time, and then. Finally, on Christmas Eve, it was or Christmas Day, I think it was Christmas Eve, when the, the sightings happened again and, and the, they were having a, a banquet to give up some, uh, some awards to members of the staff at the, uh, at the twin bases there. Um, his CO sent him out to, uh, to investigate. And he said his attitude was, I'm going out there and put an end to this nonsense once and for all. Instead of doing that, he said, it changed my life forever. He actually saw the ships. He saw the evidence of them being there, recorded it. And then after that, went through this whole realm of people destroying evidence, lying about what had happened, and all of that sort of thing. And his book, which is about that thick, uh, records his uh, memories and is worth reading if you just want a single case to, uh, to get uh, at the truth of that, as I say, one of the best documented uh, cases there, uh, there is. So uh, I, would, I would say there, there are dozens and dozens of books that have information and there's uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, people have weekly and, uh, and uh, other uh, reports that they put out, citing not only uh, observe, observa observations of, of UFOs, but also of talking to people who have seen them. And uh, the, <coughs> the chap who actually writes this uh, this report was um, himself saw a, uh, an ET who had been shot on his base because they had landed there without authority and uh, as I say, shoot first and ask questions afterwards. Is there any particular reason why, I know there's numerous species of these different beings, uh, why none of them have shown themselves um, to the people of Earth. I know there's been numerous mass sightings, but nothing big enough that the media has actually accepted it as fact. Well, there will never be anything big enough for the media to report because the media is compromised. It is totally corrupt. Um, and that's the reason people don't know. It's not because there's no news there. It's because the people who are supposed to be looking for the news are not looking for it. Because they've been told not to look for it and not to report it if they stumble over it. And uh, this has been going on for a long, long time. On July the 4th, 1947, there was an alleged crash in Roswell. That's the one that resulted in the book a day after Roswell. And the commander of the base, it was then an Army Air Corps base because it was before the United States Air Force was formed. 
during World War II it was the Army Air Corps. Um, the commander of the base put out a press release saying that um, they had recovered a saucer and that was in the local press. Three or four hours later, his commander, Major General Roger Ramey, put out another press release and said, no, that was a mistake. It wasn't actually a saucer they had found. It was a Rowan meteorological balloon. And he had one there for the press to photograph. And they showed it on air. And that is the news that was reported by the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. And in my opinion, that was the cornerstone lie of a system, a culture of constant lying. And the press has been so corrupted. In a recent book, um, by uh, a chap who wrote the, the uh, true story of the Bilderbergers, whose name will come to me in a minute, he cites the ownership and control of the world's English language news outlets, both print and, uh, and electronic. His name is Estulin, Daniel Estulin. And he wrote the, day, the, the true story of the Bilderbergers, but in his latest book, he has pages outlining the control of all of these networks. And every single one of them is either owned by or controlled by a Bilderberger. And the Bilderbergers, as I point out in my latest book, uh, latest two books actually, The Light at the End of the Tunnel and uh, The Money Mafia, A World in Crisis, um, is the most secretive, has become one of the most secretive organizations in the whole world, plus one of the most powerful. And they don't want people to know the truth of what's going on, and they're willing to pay to see that the truth doesn't get out. Pay big time. And that is the way the world is run. It's, it's you know, the talk about the free press, that's the biggest joke in the world. We don't have a free press. If we had a free press, we ha would have sightings, huge reports in the papers of all sorts of things, including uh, the Armada that flew south over Europe in, I guess it was 1963, of about 50 UFOs. And the, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe uh, uh, was concerned and about to press the panic button Unfortunately, they all turned around and went back over the North Pole. So he was satisfied they weren't Soviets and that they were in fact, had to be extraterrestrial. So he ordered a uh, study to be done. And it took three years. And what the study concluded was that there had been at least four species, at least four visiting Earth for thousands of years. This is not a new phenomenon. This goes a way, way back and predates what we call our modern history of the last 10 or 15,000 years. And uh, so did that receive widespread press? No, no. And what about 9-11? The Bush administration, the top people in the Bush administration were well aware that the attack on the towers was going to take place weeks before it happened. Isn't that news? You would think so. Have you read about it in any of the papers? Have you heard them talk about it? on any of the big television networks or small television networks? 
No. You probably have heard uh, people say, well, that's just, you know, conspiracy theory. Jesse Ventura has come out about it. Yes, there, there, are, there are books coming out, and in my latest book, Money Mafia, I quote Dr. Judy Woods, who did the most thorough investigation. It is that thick. And she points out, for example, there are only two little planes hit one, two of the towers, and yet, I can't remember whether it's five or seven, there were five buildings at least that went down. Now, how do you knock down five buildings with two jets? Neither one of which had enough thermal energy or kinetic energy to bring down one of those buildings. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. You just have to be an engineer who knows a little bit, or an architect, and a thousand of them, a thousand, one, zero, 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 architects and engineers have come out and signed a document that said the official report was not the truth, was not, in fact, what happened. Now that's news, but have you seen that reported? Only in what we call the alternate press, the kind that some of us get, uh, get our news from. So, uh, as I insist, and I, th I think it's the saddest thing that I know, and on, recently I saw um, a YouTube of a former FBI officer saying that his job was to buy the press. And he went into it chapter and verse of how he, they would approach uh, a paper and, uh, and offer them cash, offer all sorts of good correspondence cash in order to write uh, stories that repudiated what was really going on. And this, this is hard to fight too because I have one course, I get correspondence from all over the world, thousands of emails from everywhere. And my great regret is that I haven't got time to answer them all as, as carefully as I would like to, but that would take every minute of my waking time. And I've, I'm starting on my 15th and I hope last book, um, which is going to be my memoirs, but it has some other revelations in it too, but one of my correspondents from Hungary keeps saying that I'm not telling the truth, and he'll quote NASA. And NASA will be putting out story after story saying they've just discovered a planet which might have uh, sentient life on it. And in the Toronto Star, I think it was, had life could be found in 10 years. This is deliberate disinformation. Deliberate disinformation. Because NASA knows darn well that these things are real and that they've seen them and recorded them and they've played cover up ever since. And these stories are put out to fool people like my correspondent. And I finally just say, look, you either have to believe the liars or believe me. And that's your choice, because I'm telling the truth. And that's the only reason I'm here, and I don't get paid for it. So, uh, and he keeps fighting back every time he sees uh, NASA put something out. See, NASA said that, uh, that these uh, things are not real, and, uh, or something to that effect. And I said, well, you have to make up your mind. And somebody had quoted NASA, and I said, well, you're gonna have to make up your mind whether you're gonna believe the liars, which, are the officials, or whether you're going to believe those of us like uh, Dr. Greer and uh, and the the late uh, astronaut uh, Edgar Mitchell, one of my good friends, Gordon Cooper. He was another astronaut. Yeah, that got on the record. yeah, and, and and some some of them have come clean, but they don't get the <clears throat> the kind of publicity that you would normally expect from someone in that position who comes out and tells the truth. Because the free press, quote unquote, does not tell the truth. 
And if you want to go find out what's going on in the world and in the solar system and in the universe and in the cosmos, you will not get it by listening to CNN or reading the New York Times because they will not print it. This is an old trick of the rich people who run the world. And Ellen Brown in uh, the U.S. is a, a friend of mine and she's one of the, the brightest people I know when it comes to money and all about it, which is my bag. That's what I'm primarily interested in. And uh, she said when the bankers persuaded Congress to give them the right to create U.S. currency a little over a hundred years ago, that Morgan Bank hired a committee to determine the 25 most influential newspapers in the United States and to buy either the papers or control of their editorial content. And you can be very sure that the cabal, as I call it, has done the same thing today. And consequently, that all of the important news that you should be getting, so that you really know what's going on, is edited out before it's seen by you. And you've mentioned uh, in some of your other interviews that uh, there's an alien interest in Earth's atomic warfare. Uh, sightings went up after the last atomic bomb was dropped. Um, do you want to just explain to us what their interests might be and what if something happens between North Korea and the U.S., which seems like a possibility, um, do you think um, there may be some extraterrestrial involvement um, should um, we go to war, basically? It is one of the primary issues of our time. And it is true that whereas um, the um, extraterrestrials have been coming here for thousands of years, in very limited quantities and, and small numbers of species. The traffic began in earnest after the first United States uh, atomic bomb was uh, exploded in the desert uh, and has been increasing since then off and on to considerable proportions. And they're concerned because Two things, they're afraid we might blow up the world and exterminate the human species. And this is not what they want. And I would hope that not what we want, but it's what could happen to us if we have maniacs uh, making decisions. And we, uh, the problem is, and this is the kind of thing that is difficult to get your head around, the universe is a unity. It's all one big ball of wax. And physicists have found that there's an interconnection between what we do and what happens on other planets elsewhere. And so the, the people who live on other planets have a vested interest in what we do for two reasons. One, I think they like to come here and visit. It could be like the, you know, their extended uh, vacation or uh, <clears throat> longest vacation or whatever. Or it could be just exploration, like climbing a mountain or something like that, their motives. Um, it could be access to resources which has been claimed going back uh, that they've been interested in our gold for thousands of years. Um, it could be all of those things, but it is also because the wavelengths that are set off by an atomic weapon just keep going right out into the cosmos. And consequently, they're of real and direct interest to other sentient beings all over 
the cosmos. And consequently, they don't want us to do that because I've used the, uh, the parallel of children playing with matches. You're likely to set the house on fire. And that's where we are today. <clears throat> and I was really, frankly, I was very, very disappointed when President Barack Obama, for whom I had great hopes, which were not realized, allowed the Americans just uh, recently, when I say recently, in the, in the maybe three or four years ago, starting in 2017, working backwards, uh, to build a huge new plant to develop new atomic weapons and to improve old ones. It should never have happened. And it was quite contrary to what he had said when he entered politics, that we have to get the supplies down and get rid of this threat to ourselves and to our neighbors. That is the reason, and there are other weapons now that have been developed um, as a right result probably of, uh, of interaction with the uh, some of the ETs, which are every bit as bad and maybe even worse, that could be used against us if we have a false attack. And I should explain what I'm talking about because it's important. Long ago, like back in those early post-war years, there were a lot of Nazi scientists who were brought into the United States uh, under what was called Operation Paperclip. And um, they were put to work doing all sorts of things, <clears throat> working on missiles and, uh, and atomic weapons and, uh, and finally anti-gravity machines the, like flying saucers and so on. They became a very part, important part of what has become known as the, the cabal and the U.S. alternate government or invisible government, whatever you want to call it. It's, I call it the cabal. And they, um, they were really, I guess, partly at least responsible, if not totally responsible, for the policy of perpetual war on the part of the United States. And this was, it wasn't accidental that, you know, when the U.S. ran out of one war that they would start another one. It was part of policy. And one of the spokesmen in this subject that I think is the most credible and uh, is Dr. Carol Rosen who was quoting Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was a Nazi, but I think he mellowed in his senior years, his dying years, and for four years before he died, he had Carol speak for him. At least he would tell her what was going to happen, probably even at some risk to himself because he was giving away some very sensitive stuff. And he said, there, there's going to be one enemy after another because there has to be an enemy in order to justify obscene expenditures on armaments. The U.S. had no enemies that could come anywhere near them in a military sense. So they didn't need to spend hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars to the point where they even lost two trillion. Can you imagine losing two trillion dollars? Where did it go? Well, I mean, if, if you want to know where it went, it went into the space uh, program, most likely, about 99% for, uh, for sure. <clears throat> but <clears throat> this, this was, part of a long-range plan. And uh, he said, the first enemy will be the communists. 
So you'd, if you were reading the papers, you'd find out what terrible people the communists were. And I'm not saying that the Russians are all lily pure because they're not. They they are. Their KGB was one of the most rotten organizations you can imagine. And they were out to push their philosophy on as much of the world as they could. I'm not denying that. And that is known and nobody should try and avoid the, the reality of what they would like to have achieved. And probably still would if they could, but uh, they've run into some, some problems along the way. But the new gang set up a CIA based on the KGB. And they are, in my opinion, they have all the bad tricks and more. And they are right in there, and they're part of this philosophy of finding an enemy, creating an enemy, in order to justify the expenditure of hundreds of billions of dollars on weapons, which wouldn't be the case otherwise. <clears throat> so Werner von Braun says the first enemy will be the communists, and as a matter of fact, Today, in 2017, you can see them almost, the U.S. almost repeating that, creating anti-Russian um, sentiment by worrying about the interference that they had in the U.S. election. And I, uh, it takes quite a bit to get me to chuckle these days, but I really chuckled at the at the Americans being so upset about somebody interfering in their election when they've been doing the same thing to other countries for 50 or 60 years. Almost every election that wasn't going to go their way, they've tried to interfere, and I know that because they interfered one Canadian election, which I was involved, so I know exactly what, what happened. <clears throat> and then he said, the second enemy will be the terrorists. <clears throat> And uh, so, when they didn't have enough terrorists, if you go back to the days of George W. Bush, um, Osama bin Laden told him what the price of peace would be. And he said, no, this is all, all you have to do, is have a fair, a just settlement of the Palestinian question. And secondly, stop interfering in Middle East business, and three, get your troops out of what we call sacred soil. In other words, off away from the uh, Arab countries that they were operating in. And that's all you need for peace, and you will be left totally alone. Well, of course, instead of accepting that, George W. Bush said, uh, no, well, they're, they're, they're jealous of our free elections and jealous of our our standard of living and all this sort of thing were just uh, absolute nonsense because uh, the, if they had known anything about the Arab people and about the, the Islamic religion, they would know that that's just not where they're coming from. And uh, so there were only a handful of terrorists even then before the Americans might have got rid of those by complying with a very reasonable request that Osama bin Laden actually made. But instead of going that route and having peace in the world, which was possible, they said, we don't have enough terrorists. And what we have, we could, or so few that we could look after them by intelligence and police uh, means. And uh, so, uh, we'll have to do something to stir the pot, stick a poker in the, uh, in the beehive. And so they dreamed up 9-11. In a, in a document called the uh, Plan for a New American Century that the Pentagon had produced, um, they talked about these things of getting really control of that area so that the Chinese and the Russians couldn't and uh, said they had this very ambitious program, but they were afraid the American people wouldn't buy it. And they said, um, um, in the lack of something comparable to Pearl Harbor, 
Now, I actually read the, the uh, document when that was in. Later they took it out because it was kind of evidence against uh, the powers that be and, and confirmed the fact that uh, they were plotting something and that something was 9-11. So 9-11 creates the atmosphere, the, the, the situation requiring retaliation. And a very large percentage of the American people, I think it was 28%, but I can't remember the figure exactly, but a very large percentage of the American people wanted to nuke them. Well, they were going to nuke the wrong people. That game was put up by the United States and its friends. And the result, as soon as the bombs started dropping on Baghdad, they went from a handful of terrorists to thousands. And they've been increasing ever since because Americans have been dropping bombs on people and using drones to try and assassinate a person and maybe killing 20 or 30 innocent people in the process. And so put yourself in the in the position of the people who are getting killed, their relatives and so on, you would get really angry. Say, hey, what are these people doing? What kind of a moral system have they got when they're killing us and we have no protection? So they created these um, terrorists by the thousand. And then, <clears throat> this is one of the worst things that I can, I have great difficulty forgiving them for. They invoked a section of NATO, which they said, which was only there to be used in the event of an attack on one of the NATO countries, presumably by another country. But on the basis of those two little planes, the origin of which is very obscure, they said, NATO now, you're going to have to help us fight terrorists. And we want you to buy more munitions and beef up your armies and so on to help us fight this terrorist threat that extends all around the world. Manufactured madness. That's what it was. Manufactured madness. And instead of going in the way of peace, we just have been going in the opposite way. <clears throat> well then, after that, according to Von Braun, I've, Carol Rosen actually uh, put another one in the, uh, the, the book that I referred to of, uh, of Stephen Greer, of satellites. And there was a time, I didn't pay any attention to this, when the papers were telling us we had to be concerned about a satellite that might uh, possibly affect the Earth. <clears throat> Consequently, we should have uh, spent a lot of money on protections to uh, do something about it if it got too close and was going to be a threat. <clears throat> that has faded into the woodwork. And the final uh, piece de resistance, as we say, um, was to be the threat of the extraterrestrials. And they have been working on this for years and years and years. <clears throat> Dr. Greer has risked his life by exposing this. And uh, they, have, they have built a fleet of airships capable of going around the world and attacking cities just as if they were coming from outside the earth <clears throat> with the end of taking over the world. That is the aim of the game. And somehow, first of all, we have got to understand what is going on. And then we have got to persuade the American people and especially the American Congress that they have to do something about it because they're the one that's putting up the money to keep this threat alive and to risk the fate of all of the earth. 
Now, you've mentioned before there's uh, numerous alien species. Uh, we always hear about not only human abductions, but these cattle mutilations where it appears there's been highly advanced uh, operations performed on these cattle. Um, is there any particular species that might be responsible for these abductions? I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say so. Uh, the American signed uh, agreements, I think, with a couple of species <clears throat> that they could uh, do a certain amount of that in order to, uh, in exchange for uh, technology. But then there was no control that the, the uh, visitors were supposed to give them lists of the people who had been abducted. And, um, and so, uh, of course, that was never done or certainly not uh, lists that were accurate. And uh, I think, uh, I don't want to pinpoint anyone, but I do want to mention that the mutilations and the abductions didn't end with the visitors. They were taken over by the United States forces. And they have created clones of beings that look like extraterrestrials and they have abducted people who have been confronted by these clones and given the impression <clears throat> that they had been been uh, abducted by extraterrestrials when in fact they were being abducted by the American Space Command and so uh, it's getting very complicated because there's when you have so many species from different parts of the cosmos coming and with different plans and, uh, and different uh, points of view. And some of them, you asked a question earlier about would they intervene? Uh, they only know, but they have one or two cases, uh, occasions. They have cut the atomic warheads from one or two missiles that have been launched. So uh, the answer is they could and might intervene. We just don't know. But we shouldn't rely on them for protection. We should try and clean up our own act. Because to say that the extraterrestrials have been the threat so far is not true because they could have taken us over any time they wanted to. No problem. Still could. Um, but... Um, and that's because they're so much further advanced from us. We, we don't even really know where they're from exactly, but they have the ability to come here. So there's nothing realistically we could do to defend ourselves um, that, should they want. That's absolutely true. They're so far advanced that they could, uh, even when our people now are so far advanced, relatively speaking, after 50 or 60 years, that they can shoot them down, some of them. Um, they still couldn't fight a war against most of the extraterrestrial species, which are still far, far more sophisticated than we are. They're, so they're way ahead of us still. And to take them on for size is, is, would be absolute total folly because We've got some people who think they're so smart they can do anything, you know, and uh, they can't. And they shouldn't try, and they have to come sometime soon to the, to the realization that man wasn't put on the earth just to have the fun of killing his fellow, fellow human beings. That this isn't what we're all about. That um, we were created to work together, to be cooperative, to be caring, to love each other, to feed each other when, when someone's hungry. And there, there are millions of people in Africa this year who risk starving to death when we sat idly by and did very little. Some of us did a little bit, but very little. And Lots of them that, who need roofs over their heads 
and medical attention and so on. These are the things that we should have been doing to, for the benefit of our species, uh, which is an experiment, instead of saying, well, we're going to have the next and biggest empire in the history of the world. It's going to be greater than the Roman Empire. And we're going to run the show exclusively. And if it means wiping out a large proportion of the people on Earth, why well, so be it. Too many people already. Well, there are only too many people already is because we don't share the food, we don't share the medical attention, and we didn't take advantage of an offer which was made to General Eisenhower to give us that kind of peace and, and opportunity. So we've, we've made wrong choices all the way along the, the line. And we've been going our merry way as if power and greed were the predominant characteristics of our species instead of love and caring, compassion, and mutual cooperation, which is what the Creator intended. So, which way are we going to go? And that's kind of where, uh, where we're sitting at the moment, because are we going to do what we have to do to avoid this catastrophe that a handful of very sick people are planning to do to us. There are people in the Pentagon that actually think they can have a nuclear war with Russia and live to tell the tale. Well, they're psychopathic. It's impossible. It will not happen because there are so many checks and balances. But even though they don't believe that there's mutual assured destruction, which is has been the plan for 50 years or so since the, the uh, atomic weapons became widespread. There are it's a, more than enough of them around in submarines and elsewhere that it would be. And millions and millions of the U.S. population would be wiped out if they were ever silly enough, the people of the Pentagon, who have been running the show for so long, to start an atomic war with Russia. And let heaven forbid that they are allowed to do that. But first of all, we have to be aware of what they're planning. And it's been reported in a couple interviews that you've mentioned there's a federation of alien species. Um, do all of the uh, alien species kind of uh, work together, or is there warring species that war with each other? Well, I, I only know about the Galactic Federation, and I don't know much about it, so I shouldn't talk about it. But they are concerned about what's going on in the world, and they have been working um, through individuals. Um, they'll pick out a few individuals and visit them, or talk to them, or talk to them telepathically or send uh, information to them uh, by channeling. I have a, a very close friend who was uh, writing a second book right now uh, with channeling from a species called the Pacetas. Very few people have heard of it. They have a, a deal that they won't interfere. But I think that there's also a loophole if things get bad enough that they would make exceptions, but we can't count on them. I mean, maybe we can count on them, but we shouldn't count on them because they say, you clean up your act. You're in charge, it's your planet, and if it comes to a dead end, it will be because you let it or made it a dead end because it wasn't necessary and you had everything going. It's one of the best planets in the, in the whole universe. And everybody covets the fact that it's so good and you have been destroying it. And this is something that we've tried to let you know by 
in various ways over a long period. And the individual uh, communications always say, look, there are things you've got to do. Stop your clear cutting, stop your fracking, stopping, stop using uh, fossil fuels because there are better ways and I personally keep pushing and pushing for for clean zero point energy machines and in my latest book uh, Money Mafia I insist that we should really try to install zero point energy uh, energy engines in every car truck and uh, and uh, tractor and motorboat and airplane and home in the world in seven years if we want to save the planet if we're serious and we could do it people say don't be don't be silly well i know that we could do it because in world war ii we had to convert every automobile plant every a uh, refrigerator plant and every washing machine plant into armaments plants to win the war. The war we're faced with now to save our home requires us to do just the opposite, to take every armaments plant and convert it into a plant to build zero-point energy engines for cars and trucks and homes and airplanes and so on. And if we did that on a cooperative basis with all of the big powers behind it and all of the rest of us coming along either for the ride or taking our own initiative, we could do it. It's still possible to stop some, a very large part of the damage. Some of it's already irreversible in the short period. But we could still save our home, put the fire out, and have a nice, happy environment for millions and millions of people who live for a long time to come. Will we do it? Well, I don't know. Ask your politician, your MP, your congressman, your whoever represents you, what they're doing to have that come to pass and see what their answers are. And then tell them what you think if they're not up to speed on it. And there was a big CBC article, and it was on the news across Canada in March of 2013, where the government of Canada came out and said they realized that there is uh, an increasing number of UFO sightings, but the government of Canada is no longer going to be doing any of their own investigations, and instead they're going to be relying on private citizens to investigate these UFOs. Do you think that's a truthful statement that the government of Canada wouldn't really be too concerned about unidentified flying objects flying over their skies? I don't think so. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's um, typical of the uh, North American influence that our government is just uh, trying to put the people off. <coughs> so we're not... Uh, not interested because certainly NORAD would be uh, still involved in the business and we're still a member of NORAD. So those uh, sightings would all go uh, into the machine as they have been for the last 60 or 70 years. There's a YouTube video about you. I'm not sure if you know who Joe Rogan is. He's a UFC commentator. He has an extremely popular podcast. He's on numerous uh, television shows in the United States. And basically, he covers the subject of UFOs uh, sometimes on his podcast. And there's a video online that has, I guess, over 40,000 hits at this point, um, where he basically states that you're gullible if you believe the UFO stuff. And that because there's lots of videos of you talking on the subject on UFOs on the internet, you must be making money off of speaking on this subject and perhaps you're only in it for the financial rewards of uh, of speaking on the subject so because that video it's one of the things that pops up when you search your name now i was just wondering if you uh 
had any response. Of course, you answered some of these questions in our interview already, but any direct response for, from somebody that's kind of dismissed you so thoroughly without really knowing too much about you seemingly? Well, I think uh, he is obviously part of the disinformation clan. Uh, whether he's being paid to do that sort of thing or not, only he would know. I'm not surprised. I haven't seen it. I'm not even the least bit interested in looking at it because I've got better things to do with my time. But I've been telling the truth for the last 12 years. And that's the reason that there are some people who don't want the truth to be told, who have to say that I don't know what the score is. Well, they're absolutely wrong. I have probably made the odd mistake. We're all human. And I might have said one or two things that were misstatements inadvertently. But basically, everything in my book is true. In my books, both the first one on the subject and the broad subjects, the light at the end of the tunnel, the survival plan for the human species, and the latest one, the money mafia, a world in crisis, they are legitimate efforts to let the people know what is going on and to sidetrack all of the liars and all of the government employees and all of the journalists who are being paid by government agencies who are out there to misinform rather than to level with the people the way they should be if they were responsible citizens. So forget him. Um, he is in his own way like NASA trying to misinform rather than to inform and you can get the straight goods from my books and when I make a YouTube if there's a fluff in it forgive me but it will be as legitimate and as honest and as straightforward as I can possibly make it. And do I make a lot of money out of it? No. I haven't, to the best of my knowledge, ever broken even on a book. And I've written 14. If I have, I'd, it would, you know, pe peanuts. Because, and most of them have cost me money, some of them thousands of dollars to get out there. But I have a responsibility as a citizen of my country and of the world to try and alert people to how they're being misinformed by people like that and by agencies like NASA and the United States shadow government and the United States government in a way that is not only detrimental to their understanding and their perhaps actions but could be fatal if they don't get the truth from someone. And you're also in your 90s, you're financially secure, and you're putting your reputation on the line by speaking on these subjects. So obviously, you, it's something you truly believe in. Absolutely. I mean, why? I'm, I just celebrated my 94th birthday, and I have plenty to eat. I help quite a few people who don't and will continue to do so while I have the resources. I am not financially dependent on book selling. I seldom get more than a very small honorarium if I speak anywhere. I think maybe one ex exception, uh, speaking to a financial group, which was, uh, I mean, a good investment of my time. But my problem, I, I don't even normally, and I have difficulty with this, take in enough money to pay the expenses of my office. And I've had to put my own money in, in order to keep up my campaign of trying to let the people really know what's going on. And finally, if a species of extraterrestrials were to reveal themselves in a big way to the public, um, what means do you think they would uh, do to, to do it in a fashion? Uh, would they do it in trying to avoid causing panic or 
How do you think they would do it? Well, this is a hypothetical question. Politicians should learn not to answer hypothetical questions because the answer is I have no idea and I'm not worried about them doing it. I am worried about the cabal, the alternate United States government being the ones that do that for the specific purpose of taking over the world and running it as a dictatorship. And I don't believe you personally have any social media. I could be wrong on that, but for anyone watching this that might not be familiar with you, um, where could they find out more about you? I know you have your website. Well, apart from my website, which is usually out of date because I don't have to worry time to worry about it, I'm now doing uh, tweets and uh, and blogs, and I hope to do more of those in the in the year to come, in anticipation of the most important book of my life, which will be uh, uh, Hope Restored. And I'm hoping that we can get it out uh, sometime about a year from now. And I personally picked up your light at the end of the tunnel book from the library, so I know it's available in Ontario libraries, but if someone would like to purchase uh, your books, where could they find it? Well, they can get them from Amazon, of course, uh, fast delivery. If they want an autographed pa, uh, copy, they can get it from my website, which is uh, paulhellyerweb.com. That's paulhellyerweb.com. And uh, the, uh, we send them out as quickly as we can. And uh, I'll autograph, uh, for, uh, autograph it for you at the same time. So I don't make, this is not my business, but I so quite a few books from the website from people who want to uh, to obtain them that way and uh, you're more than welcome to try uh, that route and you've made a few statements to the public watching this video during this interview um, but to close off the interview is there any closing message you would like to tell the viewers yeah my closing message is we are at a, a crisis um, the crisis is one of right versus wrong, it's one of spirituality, it's the one of whether we're going to follow the dictates of the Creator by living morally and uh, cooperatively, or whether we're going to follow the dictates of the evil one, which is greed and power over other people for personal gain. Well, thank you very much, sir, for taking the time to speak with us. It's been an honor. Not at all. It's a pleasure. Thank you.